Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Steve Pettifer. I'm a computer scientist from the University of Manchester. Um, and we're finishing off this session with um, a presentation about some technology that we built at the University of Manchester called Utopia Documents. Um, I guess the, the subtitle for this talk could be How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the PDF. Um, so, this is a project that started originally funded by the Biochemical Society um, in 2009. So, this was Followed on from a discussion between Rhonda Oliver, who was the MD at the time, and uh, Audrey McCulloch, who was actually now at Alps, who came to see my colleague, Professor Terry Atwood, about how they could make their um, auxiliary data more interesting. How could, they, how could they get readers to engage with the, the auxiliary material in the journal? And as the discussion continued, it became clear that there was this kind of slightly schizophrenic thing going on, that they were putting a lot of effort into making the HTML content more attractive whilst at the same time saying that actually we kind of know that what our readers really do is they download the PDF and they keep it. So we got together and we talked about the challenges of trying to make something more interesting work with the PDF. Could we enhance the PDF um, in a way that this started to bring the advantages of the sort of interconnectedness of the web and the interactivity of the web to the medium that uh, we know that, that, um, that scholars actually like to use. And the PDF actually comes into comes in for a lot of stick, and sort of understandably in many cases, um, as being the root of many of the problems that we have in scholarly communication at the moment. So a few quotes that I've come across recently. Um, so we've had, um, the, the PDF is an insult to science. Pretty crikey, I mean, it's, it's just a file format. It's, you know, <laughs> um, it's, um, it's like inventing the telephone and then using it to transmit Morse code. Uh, and my favourite is a hamburger, which we're trying to turn back into a cow. Um, and you also kind of hear people saying this kind of thing on Twitter and online and in conferences over and over and over. I asked for some data, um, but it was sent, for me, sent to me as a table in a PDF file. And I can't do anything with that. Therefore, the PDFs are stupid. And you think, actually, there's no such thing as a stupid format. There's only stupid people. You know, if, if somebody had sent you a picture of that table, you'd be equally annoyed. Or, or had transmitted it via interpretive dance, you'd, you'd be annoyed with it. But you wouldn't blame the medium. It's, it's the wrong medium for sending data around. It. But as a way of capturing uh, the narrative of uh, somebody's thought, it's not a terrible format. And scholarly communication is not a new thing. It's not something that we've just plucked out of thin air over the past few years. It's something that we've been doing one way or another for a very long time. It's not happened by accident. The ways that we do things at the moment, although suboptimal in today's interconnected world, are not just by chance. They've evolved at least. And a scholarly article is not the same as a web page. It's, it has some things in common, but they are not exactly the same thing. And it's not a website. It's not a sort of a random interconnected thing. It's, it's not a blog, it has an extra level of formality over a blog. Uh, it's not a wiki where things are dispersed around and changing all the time, or a database. And I'm okay with that. I really like many things about scholarly articles as they stand, even though we still recognise that they are not, they're not going to stay like this forever. And I was trying to find some quotes that describe what I think a scholarly article is like, and I really like these two, keeping the minutes of science. So one of the things that we want a scholarly article to do is to be a point of thought at a moment in time, something that we can refer to, so that when I refer back to something that has been published, I can do so with the confidence that somebody went to made a sneaky change to it and inserted the word not into it somewhere, so that now my reference looks totally nonsensical because the underlying thing has changed. So there's a sort of a, there's something about keeping record of, of science or scholar or scholastic behaviour. And this is from Anita de Ward. Um, stories that persuade with data, that, are, that an article I'm not talking about a PDF, an article, a, a publication, if you like, um, is a narrative and something to back that up. And stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Oops. And PDFs have edges. Unlike the wiki, which kind of potentially goes on forever, or the web, which you, know, you can follow links in all directions for a very long time and get lost. So there's something quite nice about having things, um, at least having a focus for what you're reading, so that you can take a thought out of somebody else's head get it into yours. Um, I heard Samuel describe, he was actually talking about a library, but I think it also applies to a single article, as, as um, an article as being a thought in cold storage, something that's kind of captured there for you to, uh, to look at in the future. 
So I'd just like to do a very quick experiment. What's, what's this? I like it. Okay, so it's a redacted opinion. Yeah, but it's, it's the title page of an article. It's, it's some kind of article. Yeah? So what about, what's that bit there? So even having never, oh sorry, this is an idea that I've got from Jeffrey Builder from Crossref, who I should, um, I should credit for this particular idea. Um, it's the title. Um, that's the abstract. You know, that's probably the key words. We, uh, this bit over here is the first heading, here's the first block of stuff, then we've got other blocks of stuff. What about this one down here? Okay, so that was cor corresponding author. But we're sort of, we've become trained to recognise these things. Even with a totally redacted first page, we can go, ah, yeah, I don't know where I am. If you do the same kind of thing with many web pages, oops, that's not There we go. PDF version, HTML version, you start looking at what we've got here. Well, we've got some stuff at the top here, which is kind of links and things, don't really want those. Adverts, don't want those. Uh, some more stuff about the journal, don't really want that. Links to all sorts of stuff that's not relevant to this article. Uh, some more stuff about advertising, bits and bobs down there. All kinds of gaff. If I do the same with the PDF version, what have I got? Well, there's, I think, there's a redundant version of the name of the journal there that we could probably block out. But after that, in terms of kind of the screen real estate, and the PDF, we've typically wasted a tiny little bit down here. On the HTML version, we've kind of half our screens with gaff that we probably didn't really want. Now, there's nothing about either of these formats that makes that fundamental. You could make a very lean web page or a very untidy PDF. But there's something about the way that we do them at the moment that tends to be made of something like this. Why do people like PDFs? Apart from the fact that they have edges and that they're a good way of containing the story, um, they're self-contained. I can download it and keep it and it's mine. Um, if I change institutions, I won't have to worry about the fact that I'll have that sort of authentication taken away from me. I can read it on the train or on the path. Um, and it can't be sneakily modified. There's essentially no way of modifying a paper once it's been released in the wild in these downloadable containers because there will be thousands of copies of it. Even if I change the version online, there will be loads of copies where people will be able to say, you've changed that, that's not what you originally published. And that's not true of centralized online materials. But the interesting thing is that the PDF is still in many ways an artifact of a closed literature, because many of the things that I care about in terms of being able to have a copy that's mine so that uh, it can't be taken away from me, in an open access world, these kinds of things will change. And so the project that we started with, um, with Paul Press, which has now sort of grown legs of its own, uh, Utopia Documents, is an attempt to take some of the best qualities of the PDF and merge them with the best qualities of the web. Um, and I'll finish by just showing you a little demo of how this works. Which I hope. Okay, so we've opened Utopia Documents, which is a PDF reader, and I've loaded in a standard PDF from PLOS. Um, Mycobacterium tuberculosis drug own paper by uh, Phil Bourne and his colleagues. And immediately what we see on the right hand side of Utopia Documents is it's scavenging the web for information about this PDF article. So it tells us where it was published, identifiers for it, uh, the citation in a way that we can change the citation format if we want to cut and paste it into the documents. The old metrics associated um, with this particular article so we can see what kind of buzz is going on in the blogosphere and, um, and who's been tweeting about this article. So we click on that and that will take us to the old metrics page for this particular article. Where you can sort of dig down into a little bit more detail about what's going on in this article. A little bit further down, um, related articles from Mendeley. Um, the article level metrics from POS telling you how many times this article has been read in different formats so you can see how popular this article is. The Sherpa Romeo licensing information for this article, which tells you what you can do in terms of sharing this article with other people. In this case, it's an open access one, so you can pretty much do whatever you like. Um, and quite usefully, the bibliography. So instead of having to fertile around at the end of the PDF to see what the citations are, you can have them there on the right in a uh, clickable format. So if I go back to the main part of the paper now, one of the things that's kind of frustrating about PDFs is that a lot, of this, a lot of information can get sort of trapped in there. So there's a table which under normal circumstances would be quite irritating to interact with. You don't even recognise the tabular structure of this um, and extract it into a kind of like a little spreadsheet type format so that you can then save this into your favourite real spreadsheet for prop, doing proper editing. And we've even got a very, very simple, quick and dirty scatter block mechanism so you can see what the data of the table looks like. And you can export it to CSV to, uh, to Excel or to Spotfire. 
Uh, so that, that can be done automatically. Um, a little bit further down, we've got an example of a, a user annotation where another user, not, not me, has annotated this particular protein as being a particular entry from, from the protein data bank. So you take, you can fetch the three-dimensional protein structure um, for that object so that you can interact with it inside the paper. Or get a, um, a larger version of the three-dimensional structure that, again, you can export to some, a proper visualization tool if you wanted to do some real hardcore analysis on that. Over here on the left, we have a little speech bubble that suggests that there a, a discussion has started about this particular object, so you can see other users interacting with it. So all of these things are sort of overlaid onto the PDF. These are not modifications to the underlying file format. Uh, these are things that are done in, in real time um, and overlaid on the PDF as you're reading it, so they can, they can change. One of the neat features that we've added recently uh, is to make reading, is to make getting the citations, the in-text citations. So here. You can see 10 and 12 uh, are citations, but that tells me nothing about who actually wrote those papers. In Utopia, if you click on those, it will work out what those articles are and give you the list of the, um, the articles from the reference section. If you've got the authentication to actually get at the PDFs, you can click on that icon and it will go and fetch that article from the publisher for you and open it in a separate tab here um, inside Utopia so that you can flick between articles without having to mess about going through different library gateways. So it makes Browsing from article to article uh, pretty much as straightforward as it does browsing around web pages. And just to finish off, if there are terms in the article that you don't understand, you can highlight those, uh, hit the explore function from the menu, up there, and the sidebar changes to give you information about that specific object that you're looking for. So here are the crystalline structures from the protein data pack that are associated with g protein receptors. Um, and so you get very specific and very generic um, Entry. So here's the Wikipedia entry for um, GPCR as well, and you can browse that uh, directly within Utopia without having to even go to another tool. Um, and that's pretty much it, really. So, so it, it, this is our attempt to to build a tool that merges the best of the web with the best of the PDF, um, and it's available from there if anybody would like to find. Thank you much. I think the um, industry update panel has lived up to its reputation of being a fast-paced lightning round packed with lots of dense information. So we do have time for questions, which is great. And again, I think we could probably start with Steve so he can make a slide. So, uh, but any questions for Steve or for the panel in general? So Steve, could the functionalities of the article work offline as well? Some of them do, some of them don't. Most of the things that are doing is actually fetching from, from online sources. So, um, so if you haven't read if you haven't read the article before, you probably won't see very much new stuff. Some of it gets cached. So, for example, if you send it to your desktop and your you know, your platform, you do obviously have access to that. So, uh, yes, yes, and no. It's not in the current version, but it will be in a forthcoming version. The sort of the caching of stuff you've seen before doesn't work right now. Obviously. Looking like that, is it just a it's, it's a normal PDF, but that's what, one of the things that's interesting about it is that it doesn't require any special tu tuning of the PDF. Yeah. So the file format is PDF? Yeah. That's just a, a publisher's PDF off the publisher's website for Utopia. Just that it's free software to download for anybody to use. Yeah, right? that's right. So who's funding the development of it? Originally it was funded by um, the Biochemical Society and Portland Press. Um, it's been recently funded off the back of <coughs> small research projects, but we now have a grant from the BBSLC uh, to develop it further. And how long was, I mean, so I'm sort of looking into the future, so I mean, so that funding is ongoing at the moment? That, that's ongoing. We have a spin-out project, a spin-out company called Lost Island Labs, which interacts with publishers and uh, pharmaceutical industry for sort of bespoke, any bespoke variation to it. Is the discussion function just for other utopian users, or is that called for social media? At the moment, it's just other utopian users, but what we're planning to do is to hook that into other, other social media sites so that it's, yeah. The discussion function at the moment is a little bit, it's, it's fairly minimal, um, but, but we have plans to look into proper discussion systems. Do you have any licensing issues around it? If you own a PDF, if somebody is legally owns a PDF, can they do everything that, is there any additional licensing? 
I mean, we, we, we don't get involved in, in how you got the PDF. Yeah, no, that's so we, if you've got a PDF and you put it into Utopia, then how you got that PDF is kind of yeah. not, not our issue. Uh, but assuming that you've got it via a remote mechanism, there's no problem. Do you mean in terms of the way it fetches PDFs? No, no, I, I mean, so if somebody's got a PDF, they put it into their... I, I don't believe there's there's. No, there's no possibility somebody's got a PDF but can't do certain things with it. I don't believe so. No. Any questions for the rest of the panel? I have a question for Roz. Um, Roz, you mentioned at the beginning one of your introductory slides a number of two papers that were published. Mm. Are they available? Yes, um, they are downloadable from the Intellectual Property Office website, ipo.gov.uk. Yes, um, we hopefully, I mean, they've said to us that when they, because they're going to create some kind of database in Europe, and they've already asked whether or not the Copyright Hub could link to that. And we, you know, we're just waiting to hear that that's definitely happening, and yes, we, we're going to do it. We would like to see the Hub being one of the places where diligent search is conducted, but obviously the Hub will never be the only place, but yes. Yeah, so as I was um, uh, mentioning to, to Jamie before, we can we can tell when the instructors are making their selections if they abandon an item, right. maybe because it has a price or, or DRM. But for the students, the, at the point where the student transaction takes place, um, the closest we could probably get to see if they are not purchasing is uh, if they create account, an account but don't actually purchase something. Um, but uh, the, the, the Google Analytics that would be happening on the MOOC platforms themselves, because we're not a MOOC platform, we're just, uh, we connect with links there. So uh, the, a lot of the figures that are kind of bandied about for completion rates can be as low as, say, 3%, or some of the courses might be higher. Um, we have found that the, the purchase of content uh, for the folks who stay through to the end, um, it's a pretty good uh, match. So if you're talking about very large numbers to start with, um, it might not be necessary, you know, to, to kind of work beyond that. But I do think um, a number of the the graphs uh, divide people up into kind of you know active participant, um, observer, things like that. That um, as we learn a little bit more of the reasons why uh, folks might be taking the course. The, the item, let's say it's a history course in the 20th century, the item that they're very interested in might be in the first few weeks of the course. It might be in the last few weeks of the course. Um, a lot of these MOOCs, they are obviously, uh, co uh, content's being added weekly, but the students can actually start at any time and finish later. So they're not designed to be taken you know, completely in a synchronous manner. So uh, looking at you know, who's purchasing from those other groups and dicing it, slicing it that way, it might be possible, for example, to make like a special offer if you're just joining the course late so you can get access to that earlier content uh, at a more affordable price or give you a bonus if you purchase early. So there's, there's really endless possibilities there um, that can be explored really all to the advantage of publishers. I have a question uh, from Marianne. Uh, I might have missed the, uh, uh, the taxi driver uh, part, but I'm, I'm not sure what the vision is as to where where it will be in perhaps three, five years' time. Uh, well, we hope we're not in existence <laughs> in the sense that you know, we view ourselves as an organization that will help in this early phase, but that at some point you know, it will take hold and then you don't need to be raising awareness and driving it anymore. Um, and the question is, I mean, that was sort of my blog, it's like, well, how will we know when we get there is one of the big questions that I'm often asked. And I would say, again, when we, when we start to see 
the reward systems in place, when we start to see the sustainability models come through, the business models come through, that suggests that scholarship is going to be able to adapt effectively to the promise of technology, then we think that our job is done and we'll go back to being scholars or whatever it is that we do. But I would like to not be in existence in five years. I think we will be, but maybe 10 years, I'm hoping we'll be out. <laughs> Well, for me, I mean, I think that there was a theme through all these presentations, and that was collaboration. So one after the other, none of these initiatives or services would really exist without bringing together um, different entities within the whole scholarly communications you know, world. So that's not a bad thing. Um, join me in thanking our panelists.